Okay, so we are, actually we are quite close to proving this beautiful theorem. Uh, so let's see what's ahead. Actually this, what's ahead was planned for the previous class, but I am not anxious at all because it's better to see one good theorem than two, <laughs> two lousy theorems. I mean, that one theorem really proven and two theorems not proven. Um, so, um, but I will prove everything. So I will, I will get to everything I want. So just take it easy. Um, so, um, so, what, so what does this slide say? So this slide says one thing. So this slide says, and so that's the message, is that these trees have a certain structure. So every, so every T in T must have a certain structure. And actually, there are two things about them. So first is that, um, well, as you go down, like, well, every child of a node must have, if this label i, then all of these must be either identical to i or connected to i in the dependency graph g. And that's obvious because this is how we attached these nodes to the tree. So if t is a witness tree, then this property must hold. And the other property is that actually we never see two labels here twice. Now why is that? So can you answer why we never see two labels twice? Because we attach to the thousands from the root. Yeah, because if, if, if this ever occurred, then it would not have attached to here, but then whoever was earlier in the sequence would have, would have been attached to the other occurrence. So if this was three and three, then let's say this was an earlier, that, 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 let's say this three was here and this three was here, then why did we attach, why did, as we went back, why did we attach this three here that we should have attached this three instead, instead here? Right, so simply, all, childs, all children are different. Okay, so that's just a proper, that's just the syntactic property of this tree, and I will not use anything about witness trees from now on, just these, just these two properties. So that's the good news, right? So I, we don't have to think of any complicated properties of witness trees, just these two properties. Okay, so now are we ready to do the calculation? So what is the calculation we are looking ahead? So recall that all what we need to do is to take all possible witness trees with root i and just sum up the probabilities of those. So that's all what we have to do. And moreover, for each such tree, we know the probability by the previous lemma, at least the upper bound on the probability, but if there was a discussion with some people, so uh, uh, it does, uh, well, okay. So the, the, we know the probabilities of each of these, the upper bound is sufficient. So sum these up. So we, so we now from the, by the virtue of the previous slide, we know the structure, and that's all we need to know the structure. And by the virtue of even earlier slide, we know the probabilities. So all what we need to do is now just sum up for all these objects that have this structure. So for all these objects, we have to sum these things up. So that looks like a very pleasant mathematical task because, for instance, we see like kind of, um, 
like arithmetic series and so forth, or sequences, although it's a little, of course, it's a little complicated and it looks like, um, you know, um, so some of those calculations, but um, so here is what is going to help us. So the Galton-Watson branching process. So what is the Galton-Watson branching process? So that's, that's going to be the tool of doing this summation. So that's just a technical tool, and Gabor could have done it, or Gabor and, Mos and, and Leo could have done it differently. But um, so, um, so the, this branching process is the following, that, um, that we start with, so we have this, this underlying graph G, right? That's always there. That's our dependency graph G. And so this G like never, like never changes. So we have a graph G, let's say one, two, three. And so we start from a top node where we start, we want to start from I, and so we fix the top node. And then we are now attaching children. And for, to one, we can either attach one or we can attach two. Because uh, we can either attach itself or a neighbor. Now, we actually, so now, uh, we also have, so G is carved in stone, but also the Z1, Zn in the Lova local lemma uh, are also carved in stone. So with probability uh, like Z1, we decide if, if with probability Z1 we are going to attach a 1 here, and with probability 1 minus Z1, we are not attaching that. So maybe we chose to attach. And likewise, with probability Z2, we are attaching, and with probability 1 minus Z2, we don't. So for instance, that we attached, now that this attached, this was attached, had probability Z1 times Z2. And well, and then we just keep going. So let's assume that we, so here we again, we can attach either one or two, and let's assume we did not attach any. So what is the probability of that? Well, the probability of that is one minus Z1. And here that this branch also gives no child, that's one minus Z2. And let's assume that neither of these, so to 2, we can attach which numbers? 1, 2, two or 3. So 1, let's assume it's not attached. So then the probability of that is 1 minus Z1. The probability that 2 is not attached is 1 minus z2, and the probability that 3 is not attached is 1 minus z3. So then this 3 uh, is simply stays as is. Right? So it won't branch anymore. It stays as is. So we get that this 3 we get exactly with this probability. So that's the Galton-Watson branching process. But, you know, if it, if, there, if it had a child, it could have a yet a more child and so forth. So eventually, if this process just dies out and it will not, no children will like bring any more children, then it freezes into some tree. So that's the Galton-Watson branching process. Um, so now here is a lemma which says that 
the probability of a tree in the, that the Galton-Watson branching process yields a tree like this, or like any fixed tree T, is exactly this expression. Now, what is this expression? Well, well, the zi's are. Oh, I'm so. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the z. So this does not need any explanation. So this contains the z primes that I did not talk about. So the z prime is, by definition, is this expression, which is like, for instance, here the z two. In this case, I mean the z prime 2, in the, what would be the z prime 2 in this case? Like for this particular tree, and um, uh, yeah, so what would be the z prime 2? Yeah, yeah, so z prime 2, okay, so z prime. 2 would be uh, z2 times 1 minus z1 times 1 minus z3. And z prime 3 would be what? z3 times z2. And z 1 prime is z1 times 1 minus, so now the neighbor, right, z2. Okay. This is assuming. Okay, so this lemma says that, for instance, the probability of this tree is supposed to be, um, okay, 1 Minus, so that's the z i is the to, is the root node, right? The i was the root, so one, so here one is the root, so one minus z one divided by z one times, and then you have to multiply, like you take all the nodes here, and you have to and you have to multiply all the z primes, like z, so. These are all the z primes. So you have to multiply these, like in this case, because it contains, no, no, I'm sorry. This one contains a 1, a 1, and a 2, right? So, it should, so you should multiply, let me write it down. So you should multiply the z1 prime. So the z1 prime is z1 times 1 minus z2, and again, the z1, you have to move z1 prime, so I'm just writing a square here, and then the z2, which is z2 times 1 minus z1 times 1 minus z3. And uh, so this is the probability. Right? But this is also the probability, right? So is this the same as this? Well, it better be, right? Otherwise, we can go home. Uh, it's the same if you add a closing parenthesis in the last problem. I did not. <laughs> Thank you. So that was what I was missing. Uh, OK, so hopefully it's the same. So the 1 minus z1 here occurs whatever once and twice. And here occurs once and twice. So basically, we have to check that everything occurs. And of course, this z1 and this cancels. And in any case, so you see that that's a product. So so you see that this is a product, and that's a product. And for the lemma, it's kind of mechanical. To, I mean, there is some slight mathematics to prove it, but I am not going to prove it. Because you see that these are all product, that this lemma just says that it's a certain kind of product 
of the zi's and one minus zi's that occur in the nodes, and this, and when you do it in the natural way, that that's another product, and you just have to prove that, like after cancellations and whatever, you get the two products are the same. So that won't kill any of you to prove it, and that's not the point. The point is the following conclusion, and that's the concluding side of the, that's the conclusion. Yes. Yes. No, that's forget about, so we are talking about the Galton-Watson branching right. process. Yeah, exactly. So uh, it's just that for the probability of the tree occurring in the signal, that would, that would give the... Input. Well, I disagree. That is, I mean, it's this form. This formula is not zero. Uh, yeah, in, in, the, in the process, yes, this, this gives the formula, but for the sequence of, for the sequence S. Yes. So just this specific tree, but then the condition, it doesn't... Exactly. Oh. 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 oh, okay, so, oh, so you are saying that in the sequence it occurs with probability zero. So it's not in calligraphic T. Uh, okay, so that's a very good observation in this case because that shows that we are now giving an upper estimate. So <clears throat> we are looking at everything <coughs> which, syn which is syntactically, um, which is syntactically, like just satisfies these rules, and we are just gonna sum up the, we are just gonna sum up those, and we don't care about the semantic anymore. And clearly, the, um, I mean, the, our witness trees are among these. <coughs> Okay, so let's see the concluding slide. So the concluding slide is that, so we want to show, again, this is what we want to show, that if the root is i, then these trees, then the probabilities, uh, if we sum up for the trees, is less than zi divided by one minus zi. So, um, so as we have proven, and in our main lemma, which was the most important lemma, that, the pro that for every tree, so now it's not the Galton-Watson process, now we are back to the, we are back to the moser tardos so every, every tree, as we had this long discussion, has this, so the probability that it occurs in the resample sequence is is this. So this was the sum we wanted to create. So this is exactly the sum we want to estimate. And so now we are going to relate it to the uh, Galton-Watson branching process. So here is the point when we are relating it to the Galton-Watson branching process. And so we observe now that each each of these PAVs, like each of these PAVs, so, uh, so these are the labels that occur in the tree, uh, but so these are just probabilities of AVs. Well, the, the, if you look at the definition of Z, if you look at the definition of Z prime, right, that was just exactly what, what occurred in the, in the right-hand side in the standard LLL condition, right? The ZV times the product of one minus the neighbors. So the ZV prime is if the Lovas local lemma condition holds on the PIs, then this, this is an upper bound on the PI. So now I can, uh, here I can estimate the PIs from above I'm sorry, estimate the PIs from PAV above from Z 
v prime. So there is the same expression except each PAVs are exchanged for ZV primes. And so now here, um, I am, um, so, so now this is for a, for, for a particular tree, then I get this product. So what is this product? Well, now if I go back to the previous lemma, then this product is almost the probability with which this tree occurs in the Galton-Watson process, except that this probability is multiplied by zi divided by 1 minus zi. So this product is pt times zi divided by 1 minus zi. So let me just, uh, and, and so let me just write it that way, that so it's pt, so now I am writing pt times zi and 1 minus zi, so I'm exchanging this product with pt times zi divided by 1 minus zi. So once I have done that, then so I have the zi divided by 1 minus zi plus the sum of all pts. And now here comes the, the finale because the sum of pts, well, these are the sum of probabilities for each, well, for each t's, for each different trees with root i that occur in the Galton-Watson process. But the sum of, but, but, you know, every run of the Galton-Watson process produces exactly one tree or maybe zero tree because it might go to infinity. So this sum, this later sum, is actually just one, right? It's just the sum of exclusive events in a probability, probabilities of exclusive events in a probability space, so it's one. So actually this sum is one, and so at most, and so I get that this is at most zi divided by one minus zi. So finito. How to say that. Um, so now, um, let's see how much time we have. Uh, 15 minutes. Okay, so let me, um, okay, is there any question? So there is a kind of technical question, but imagine we did, we, we take the, the instead of the farther from the roof uh, the, uh, vertex, we take the historically first vertex when we select to which parent we connect a given, uh, a given vertex. So uh, where the proof breaks, or, 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 or it's still okay? Well, I would have to think about, right? You just should have to think about two things. Um, does it have the product CRM still, and does it have the... Um, and, but the product theorem will hold um, because for the product theorem, all what you need is that if something, if two guys interfere, then the other guy should be also, if, if a guy interferes with you, then that guy should be also on the tree somewhere. So the product theorem requires only that. Now you also need that every tree occurs once. Is it Akno? Uh, uh, Akno. Yeah, so it, it, of course, if you can do it, so, I, uh, so the question is if you gain something by it. No, no, nothing, but just... No, no it's, but it's interesting because all these, all these variants can be interesting because of many reasons. So 
but indeed, one should just check those two things. Um, so, okay, so we have like 15 or maybe only 10 minutes. So, again, I have already said several times that the, that the, that the Moser proof uh, gave this, uh, maybe I did not say it, gave this elegant information bottleneck argument and uh, it also reaches the LLL bound, but I did not emphasize though, then of course it was a creative leap of Joseph Beck in 91 to consider the efficient version of LLL because the LLL was created in 71 and um, like it was so beautiful that everyone was happy with this beautiful mathematical proof and not, nobody was thinking that, okay, but how about actually finding the coloring or the solution? So Beck raised the question and answered, but uh, he did not reach the LLL bound. He got something worse, and his proof um, um, was not something that you would say it's from the book of Erdős. You know that the book of Erdős is which contains the most beautiful proofs, while I think the proof that I explained like in the previous class and now, I think it's, it's from the book. Um, but um, never, uh, okay, so, so now I, <clears throat> so we can be all happy about this new proof, but recall that so the Tardos Moser relied on the Moser inspiration, and now we like scientists, or, or, or we, we are now going back to the Moser's original inspiration because it turns out that we can prove sometimes more than just from the low mass, low column alone. So this information bottleneck argument alone is a very powerful tool which is not fully exploited, and there is a lot to do about it. So. Let me, exp let me try to explain the information bottleneck argument um, on an example, which I started to look at because what, I, what bothered me is that, well, if we want to prove that if you have just a graph with maximum degree delta, then you can clearly color it with delta plus one colors. You can also use the low mass local lemma, but it gives something that you can color it with two E times delta colors. So how comes that this big shot low mass local lemma gives a worse bound than the trivial greedy algorithm? So here I am trying to now employ the, um, the information bottleneck argument of Moser to actually reach that delta plus one bound. So here is how it goes. So first, I'm not talking about degree, but an even stronger definition, which is the backward degree. So the backward degree is delta. If you can order the nodes, uh, <clears throat> well, is at least, is at, is at, at most delta, if you can order the nodes such that, um, well, from, that, that the number of edges that going backwards uh, from a node is at most delta. So if you have such an enumeration. Now clearly, the greedy algorithm colors this um, such a graph with at most d plus one colors. Right? Because when you go to the next node, then you see d colors, so you always have an extra color with which you can color that node. So as you color it inductively, then clearly the chromatic number of such graphs, like for instance a pass has delta, has delta what? Delta equals one, right? Because for a pass, if, if you order it right, you just, okay, so delta one and the pass can be colored with two colors. Um, okay, so, but how do you do it with the Moser type information, uh, compre uh, information compression argument. So for that, for the Moser type information compression argument, you would need 
an algorithm first, a randomized algorithm. So in your randomized algorithm, you do the same as like you do it with the greedy, except when you come to the next, you come to the current node, instead of coloring it with uh, the extra remaining color, you just color it with a random color. Now if we color it with a random color, the new node, then it might conflict with some previous color. So if, it, if you see any conflict, then you are just, you are just recoloring it randomly again. So you do the same as in Greedy, except that you apply random coloring, and if you see any uh, conflict, then you are coloring it again. And if you don't see any more conflict, then you step forward. Okay, so this is your algorithm, and now see how we can create an information compression. Uh, so how much randomness do we invest into this coloring procedure? Well, if, we, if our algorithm does N, capital N, colorings, so if it, if it uh, and recoloring also counts, so if you try to color a node and you try to color again, that counts twice, and let's say you proceed, you cry, color the next node as the third time and so forth. So you count every coloring step. And now let's assume that the graph is just not D plus one colorable. It means that this algorithm just runs forever, right? It just has to run forever. Because, you know, this, if, if, it goes, if it goes all the way, then it actually it colored the graph with delta plus one color. So otherwise, it just runs forever. So now let's say it does not run forever, but it runs for like a very long time, where n is the time. So then the randomness you used, well, each time you picked, and here I am not taking the logarithm, I am just counting the is delta plus one to the n, because at each time, and you can think of this table saying of, of Moser and Tardos, that let's assume that I, am already, I already have this like colors, like five, two, so someone just gives me this table, and I am just reading, when I am recoloring and recoloring, I am just reading things from this table. And so the question is, how many such tables do I have? Well, I have delta plus one to the n if this sequence has length n. Right, so now I claim that actually this sequence of length n, whose every element is, a, is from a set delta plus one, I can encode in, in less than this number. So if I take the logarithm, so the log of this number many bits requires the encode, but I can encode it with less than that bit. But now I'm not taking the logarithms, I'm just taking the numbers. So how can I encode this cleverly, exploiting the fact that my algorithm failed me? Well, uh, I want to retrieve this sequence of colors that I used from two pieces of information. The first piece of information is the final coloring that when I run the entire sequence, so it is just given to me the final coloring, let's say. And the other piece of information is the, is the record of, is the log of the algorithm. So what is this log? What is this record? Well, this record says the following, that here in the first, I did not see any conflict, so I could proceed. So here I could proceed, proceed. So here I saw a conflict with the, with the first edge down, so with the deepest edge down. So here I saw a conflict with the Again, so is this from the, from the same nodes, because now I am stuck in this node, 
and I recolored again, but at this time I see a conflict with the, se with the second edge down. And then I can proceed and I can proceed and here, uh, like this is the picture that it represents, I see a conflict with the third, so one, two, three, a third edge, so meaning that this is colored the same way as this. So I am recording not the colors themselves, but that with along which edge, which of the first edge, where I see a conflict. So I consider this record of the run. And I claim that from the final coloring and from this record, I can completely recover all the colors used in this random sequence. So now before proving this claim, Let's see, let's count how many, how many, I mean, how much information do I have here? So the final coloring, so how many of them there can be? Well, there can be, at, well, I don't know what L is, so I generously, I just say, so M is, let's say, the size of the graph. So I generously say that I don't know what L is, but so for L, I have M choices. And whatever L is, um, like the delta plus one, uh, so this color delta plus one to the M is certainly greater or equal than the number of such sequences. Note, however, that this formula does not contain capital N at all. So, so be, I, I want to get a contradiction when this capital N is large. So this part is not going to help me if I want, uh, so in any case. So this part is not going to destroy me. So how many records do I have? Well, in the records, I can advance at most m times. So here I have, like in this sequence, I have these advanced signs at most m times, and the actual numbers at most uh, capital N times. So it's the places of these advanced signs is, I mean, the configuration without knowing these numbers is, is this. And I just generously, again, put here an M because I don't know like whether it's really M or it's M minus one or M minus two. So I don't know the number of these bars. So how far I proceeded. So I, this M, uh, factor of M accounts for that. And finally, what is most crucial is that um, there is this, instead of delta plus one to the N, there is this delta to the N. So in this formula, it looks like a complicated formula, but the only crucial thing about it is that it contains a delta to the N. Why delta to the N? Because I have delta edges backwards, so when I say where the conflict was, I can describe it, well, that's a number between one and delta and not a number between one and delta plus one. And hence my gain. So my gain is, if you look at this formula and this formula, it's simply if n is large, like you can forget about all these because this is like, okay, it contains n, but m, you can think of it as a constant. So this is just polynomial in n, and this is exponential in n, and here the ex base of exponent is larger. So, so, I, so I could compress this information as long as I can show that I can recover from these two pieces of information, I can recover um, what, what random uh, choices my algorithm have made. And I can recover that because, okay, so um, I have, uh, okay, so how do I recover it? So let's say this is my final coloring, like let's say, so pick a number like five, so one, two, four, five, three, two, one, one, four. 
Right? This was my final coloring. Um, and so let's assume that I have invested. Um, um, OK, and so that was my, uh, and so I had some, some sequence which told me like how I should color, but so now I have the record of the run. And so the record of the run starts, well, it has to start with a bar anyway. So, so what, was the, what was the first element here? Well, the first element here had to be one, right, because I proceeded here at the final color here was one, and so this did not change, so that had to be a one. So, okay, so here I proceeded again, let's say, and so therefore, um, the final color, well, it did not change since the beginning, so it had to be a two. So now, let's assume I still, I had this bar, so the next color had to be a four. So now, um, it said that when I am, so okay, so now I arrive here. And so here now I colored it somehow with some number, and but when I colored, uh, okay, so I know of course the graph, so I know that let's say that these were the three edges out from this node, and so now this one tells me in this record that this, that the color with which I colored conflicted, conflicted this. So since it conflicted this, well, the only way it could conflict this that it was also a one. So that question mark was a one. Right? And so then, I, again, I colored, and at this time, it conflicted with this. So again, it conflicted with this, so it means that next time it that next time it was a two. And then it did not conflict, so it went on. So now it stepped here, um, and then I know that, um, and uh, then it went further. So I know that the, that the color with which I colored here was three, and then. I'm sorry, there was a five, so the five, and then again it went further, so that was a three, and again then it went further, and so now again um, <clears throat> it, was, it was again conflicted with the third one, that was this, let's say, so the three went out, and with the third one, so it was a five, and so forth. So you agree that from that sequence I could recover the um, I could recover the uh, original sequence. So, but now again, if I count how many info, how, how many ways this can be done is this number of ways, and this is less than that, and so that's not possible, right? So it means so so it means that. Um, that there ought to be a lot of there ought to be a lot of random choices, which either uh, like it won't run for n steps, but it terminates. In which case, like I did color after all the graph with delta plus one color. So basically, that's what. So I can even compute like quantitatively, like what is the, uh, so I can, I can even give numbers and probabilities uh, from this information bottleneck argument. So this is an example to the information bottleneck argument, and um, I am pretty sure that now I am over time, but let me just check to verify indeed. Um, but naturally, I wanted to finish the argument. Um, and um, um, I wanted to tell you an open qu question to the end, but it's not like a major open question, so maybe I just skip it. If you, if you want to 
Just show yeah. the slide and don't No, say there it. is no slide to it. <laughs> there is no slide for it. It's just basically I, okay, so it's like the, in the shearer, like the shearer is the absolute LLL only for undirected graphs, but the dependency graph is sometimes directed and not undirected. And I just wanted to ask, so can you duplicate shearer for directed dependency graphs instead of undirected graphs? The only long explanation to this is that I wanted to show you an example which was exactly graph coloring where the, where the, where the dependency graph is directed and not undirected. Um, okay, so, well, um, this is, uh, I guess, for what, how much time I had for this beautiful topic. And, uh, of course, there are the articles that I warmly recommend for you to read. Um, and there are a number of them. There is, um, uh, I wanted to also tell, but it did not have time, the Moser, uh, the info, uh, the Moser information bottleneck for his case. But, um, um, also, this information bottleneck is used now for the non-repetitive coloring. It's a new article that I also want to bring your attention to. Thank you very much. <laughs>